The Rosicrucian and Christianity Lectures by Max Heindel Narrated by Matthew Schmitz Lecture 19 The Coming Force Vril or What? So much is written and spoken of the inner worlds from the occult point of view. So much stress is laid upon the fact that we possess higher vehicles, are capable of developing them and functioning consciously in them, that it seems needful to emphasize at times the enormous value of the dense body and of the visible world to which it correlates us, to counteract, as far as may be done, the disdain with which some people regard the world in which we now live. Let us rest assured that there are great and exalted intelligences behind evolution, who order all things with a wisdom which neglects no factor, and let us try to understand the aim and object of our present mode of existence. Then we shall soon see that all is well, that there are good and sufficient reasons for our placement in the present phase of concrete existence, and for the limitations which result in consequence. We see that at the present time, the Western world is going through a phase of material development, and many among us who are grappling with the things of the spirit are prone to look down upon the activities of the ordinary man with a feeling of, thank God that I am holier than you, which is entirely gratuitous. The much despised ordinary person, on his side, looks askance at us, who talk with glib familiarity of both heaven and hell, but are not very up-to-date in our knowledge of material affairs. He has a very strong feeling that it is our first and foremost duty to know something about the material world, to do our duty here, to the best of our ability, before we aim to soar into the clouds. To emphasize his argument, he will point to India, where the people suffered death by famine, yet are too indolent to work. They think of nirvana, and forget present conditions. The ordinary person will bid us look at the backward condition of these Orientals, and attribute it to their belief in the doctrine of rebirth, which inculcates habitual disregard for the present phase of existence in them. He will then contend that spiritual development, particularly outside the methods of the recognized churches, is detrimental in the highest degree, and he is largely right in his assertion, but there is also a deeper view to be dealt with later. To develop in a safe and a sane manner, we must positively have a correct appreciation of the mission of this world in the divine plan of unfoldment, which we call evolution, and we must do our full share of the world's work. On the other hand, it may also be said that occult viewpoint gives a deeper insight and a wider scope for usefulness than the mere surface view. Let us therefore examine the path of advancement in the material world from both viewpoints. It has been stated in lecture number two that all things in this visible material world are crystallized thought forms, and an illustration was given of how an architect forms a house in his mind, of how from that thought form he draws the plans and the workmen build the house. Graham Bell's imagination crystallized into the telephone, Fulton's to a steamboat, etc. But of course those ideas were not perfect at once. A great deal of experimental work was necessary before the inventions cited were brought to sufficient efficiency to become useful in life. If we imagine this world in which we live to be a world of thought wherein we might form images like mental pictures, but which would provide no way of concreting our images in metal or wood such as we now use, what would have happened in the case of the telephone or the steamboat? The inventor would have been through with his invention in a trice. There would be no material condition to show the imperfections in his thought, and consequently he would not have learned to think right. It is the mission of the concrete material world to make our mistakes manifest. We are developing an enormous power within ourselves, and we have in the dense physical world the most ideal condition for developing the requisite ability to use it properly. Apart from such ability, and given subtler conditions of matter, it would work immense harm. What is that coming force will be seen when a backward glance at the past development has given us the gauge of true perspective. In the earliest dawn of man's existence, he dealt principally with the solids. His first implements were such stones, sharp or blunt, as he found ready at hand. Later he commenced to trust himself to the liquids when propelling his first crude craft on water or to turn the primitive water mill. Still later he learned to use a gas, wind, as a force of propulsion for ships and mills. That was an immense advancement. It brought the most distant parts of the world into communication, 
and widened the scope of man's knowledge immeasurably, but even the progress attained by the use of air power fades into insignificance before the strides we have made whence we started to use the more ethereal gas, or steam power. That has turned the wheels of progress at a rate which leaves us dumb with astonishment. Yet even the wonders accomplished by steam are as nothing when compared to the thousand and one improvements in communication and knowledge development by the utilization of that still finer force, electricity, which circles the globe with a message in fewer seconds than the years it would have required by earlier means of propulsion. Thus we see that human progress has been accomplished by the use of finer and finer forces, and that each time we have learned to utilize a subtler energy than heretofore used, we have made a wonderful stride in civilization. The waves of the sea, which are fluid, will raise the decks of a ship in a few moments, twist and bend the strongest iron stanchions as if they were but wires. The winds may blow the masts of a ship overboard in the twinkle of an eye, yet winds are but air, a gas. Water, a fluid, is tearing down the hills of Seattle, Washington, and making the city level at a rate impossible to the solid pick and shovel. When we look at the great locomotives with their extremely heavily built trains, and we admire their ponderous bulk, do we ever realize that the reason why they have to be so solidly built is because they are to be acted upon by an invisible, elastic gas steam? The water wheel was of no use as a power producer, except when in direct contact with a stationary source of energy, a waterfall. Wind power is better. It could be used as a force of propulsion all over the world, but was fickle and uncertain. Steam was more nearly ideal, as it is procurable at will almost anywhere, but required ponderous machinery to be moved around wherever the force is to be used, as best illustrated by the locomotive, which is such a movable power plant. Electricity may be transmitted for many miles by means of little wire, and can be used anywhere along that line. It may be stored, bottled in fact, and taken along. It may even be transmitted from place to place without wires along the all-pervading ether. We have now shown that man's progress in the past has been accomplished by the utilization of forces of increasing subtlety, water, air, steam, electricity, and that the increasing utility of each of these forces is further enhanced by the faculty in which it may be transmitted and utilized at various places. The latest advancement in the transmission of energy from a central source to various points without visible material connection, as in the wireless telegraphy. Having reviewed past accomplishments, it must be evident that the further progress of the human race depends upon the discovery and utilization of a yet finer energy transmissible with still greater faculty than either of the forces yet known. What is that new force? What will it accomplish in the advancement of the human race? And along what lines are we to look for its discovery? Such is the natural threefold question, and we shall attempt to answer it. In his Coming Race, Bulwer Lytton gave us an inkling of what coming force will be. Like all other such stories, it has never been taken seriously, but regarded only as the fantastic imagination of a clever writer. Jules Verne's stories met with a like attitude of admiration for this vivid fancy upon the part of the public, yet how much in them has already been realized. Around the world in eighty days is too slow for the twentieth-century globetrotter. Submarine navigation and bird-like flights are facts today. In truth, the human mind is incapable of imagining anything that cannot be achieved. That seems an extravagant statement, but is it not justifiable in view of what has been done? And reverting to our main line of argument, something akin to the vril of Bulwer must be discovered before man can take the next great step in advancement. True, great and marvelous discoveries lie ahead of us in the further exploitation of the forces we already possess, but the next great step depends upon the discovery and preparation for the use of the coming force. Attempts at making the steam engine were made many centuries ago by the ancients before we succeeded in the later days. Electricity was known in a very small way also by them, but it took a long time to ripen these ideas sufficiently to make them directly available for use. Similarly, while we go ahead and exploit these forces, we know we must also prepare for the coming force, and if we can find it, we may be able to find the means of using it the quicker. Let us look a little closer at Bulwer Lytton's Vril. It may be that, beneath the fantastic garb, a valuable clue is hidden. Vril was a force generated within each of the beings of our story. 
It did not depend upon outside machinery, which cost money and could be had by a favored exclusive few, but not by the majority. All without exception possessed this power, from birth to death. That is certainly a yet higher ideal than even a central power station. No need for elevators when everybody levitates at will. No need for streetcars or railways when everybody can move swiftly and easily by his own inherent force. No need of ships when man can move through the air without such cumbersome contrivances as those which move upon the surface of earth and water, and see how much less resistance he will have to overcome who flies through the air as the bird does than if forced to depend upon an airplane or similar contrivance. Like all other forces, Vril could be used as a means of destruction. It was swift in that also, so exceeding care would naturally be required of one who used it. He must have self-control in highest degree, for if he were to give way to temper, dire disaster would surely happen. If we are to use such a force as that, we can see how absolutely essential it will be that we be good and kind and make no enemies. Our lives would be in the hands of others to an extent undreamt of now. When we look within ourselves to see if it is possible that an energy of that description be incipiently growing, we cannot look very far before we are forced to recognize the fact that a power having vast possibilities is there. Thought Power Our ideas take shape as mental pictures which we form with great facility and afterwards crystallize into material things in an exceedingly slow and laborious manner as cities, houses, furniture, etc. All that is made by the hand of man is crystallized thought. Nor should we regard its present slow mode of manifestation from thought to thing as an indication of its possibilities, or allow the fact that it escapes and eludes us to cause dismay. It has been the same way with the other forces we have already harnessed to our wheels of progress. For countless ages the waves of the ocean have wasted energy in beating upon the seashore. By now inventors are beginning to harness them as they would have coupled the waterfall to the electric dynamo. For a like period, the wind swept the land and sea before man learned to use them as carriers of the commerce of the world by appropriate sailing vessels. For ages, steam escaped into the air from the camp kettles of primitive humanity before they learned to concentrate its power and use it in the various industries. In like manner, as the steam escaped uselessly from the kettles of olden times, does the radiant energy of thought escape from humanity of today, and as the steam was utilized by concentrating it, so may also this subtler but enormously more potent thought power be concentrated and used to do the work of man with a facility impossible of imagination even by comparison with the present forces, for they are merely utilitarian, working in, with, and upon already existing things, but thought power is a creative force. We know how dangerous the other forces are when harnessed and concentrated, while the steam is escaping from the camper's kettle, it can do no serious hurt. Electricity, generated by the friction of a belt or by rubbing a piece of amber, is no danger to anyone. But when steam is generated in quantities and confined in a steam boiler, it may burst its bonds in the hands of an incompetent workman, and so may electricity under pressure in a wire kill the one who ignorantly meddles with it. Similarly, we may infer that thought power, misdirected or ignorantly used, would have a far more disastrous effect, because it is a much subtler force. Therefore, it is necessary that man should be placed in a school where he may learn to use this enormous force in a safe and efficient manner. And whether we realize it or not, the wise teachers who work unseen but potently with humanity have already placed us in this concrete existence, the physical world. Whether we know it or not, every day, every hour, we are here learning the lesson of right thought, and as we learn it, more and more we shall become creatures like our Father in heaven. Thus we see what a great mistake it is to despise this concrete existence and live in the clouds of hopes and aspirations which have to do with the higher life and the higher worlds to the neglect of our duties in the present concrete material life. It should be equally plain, however, that it is also wrong to confine ourselves to the purely material phase of life to the exclusion of the spiritual side of our nature. Extremes are dangerous, if we recognize the two poles of our being and endeavor to guide our material existence by light of our spiritual perception, we shall learn the lessons so wonderfully provided for us in the school of experience in a far shorter time than required if we go to either of the extremes. 
What are the results of the following one or the other of the extremes may be seen by a comparison from the occult viewpoint of the Hindus with the Western world. As stated before, people of a materialistic tendency in order to justify their aloofness from spiritual affairs will point to countries and peoples which are going in that direction, particularly to India. Bid us note the backward state of the Hindus, the indolence of the Oriental, and attribute it to their religious trend. Others have tried to defend them on the grounds that they are massed together in an arid mountainous country that is unable to feed the millions that populate it, and hence disease and famine are inevitable. They point to the scorching sun and the devastating floods of India, and contrast them with our own fertile, thinly populated land, where abundance is the portion of all, and they almost imply that it is an injustice on the part of God to give to one what he denies to another who is more worthy in the opinion of such critics. That the condition of the Hindus is such depicted, and even worse than we ever get to know, is a safe assertion. Looking at life from the ordinary Western standpoint of one life only, those people are really to be pitied as victims of the caprice of an unjust God. But when we understand the laws of consequence and rebirth, and the activities carried on in the second heaven, we shall readily comprehend the spiritual reason for the different conditions of nations, as well as of individuals. The scorching sun, the arid condition of the soil of India, and the destructive floods are only effects produced in the material world by causes in the spiritual realms, as are all other acts of nature and man. There is a spiritual explanation to every phenomenon that goes deeper to the roots than the material facts. There is a spiritual reason for the poverty and the climactic conditions which cause them in India, as well as there is a deep purpose in our prosperity. To get at that reason, it is necessary to keep clearly in mind the distinction between the body and the spirit that inhabits it. All spirits are alike except that some have developed faster than others. The races are only bodies created by the spirits, and as a class of spirits evolves it, goes from race to race. The most accomplished do the pioneer work and bring the race to its highest perfection. When that is attained, they form a new race and the race bodies which they have discarded are taken in turn by less developed spirits, and therefore commence to degenerate. When thus these become useless to them also, they advance and turn the race bodies over to another and still lower class of spirits. Under their influence, the race degenerates still further, and at last, when there is no spirit so backward that it can gain experience by using the degenerate form any more, the women become sterile and the race dies out. It has served its purpose. We of the Western nations at one time inhabited Hindu bodies. That was the time when India was in its glory, when the race was evolving both physically and spiritually. That was in the so-called Golden Age, when the sacred writings came into existence, when the great temples were built, when the spiritual and material evolution of India was at its height. But man was destined to master the material world to the full. While he thought of himself as a spirit principally, and had an absolute and unswerving faith in the continuity of life, while he knew positively that birth follows death as surely as death follows birth, he also felt that there was endless time to progress in, and therefore made only indifferent efforts to develop the resources of the material world. Therefore it was necessary that he should forget for a time the doctrine of rebirth, and think of the life he was living as the only one so that he might concentrate all his efforts on making the most of his opportunities for material advancement. The way that was accomplished has been described in earlier lectures and more fully in the Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception. Thus we, the spirits now inhabiting the Western race bodies, left the Hindu bodies and built, in turn, the bodies of the succeeding races, gradually attaining higher and higher levels of material development during earth life and as the life in heaven between incarnations is an outcome of a previous life and a preparation for the next, where we build out future bodies and our future country under the direction of the great creative hierarchies as described in lecture number six, we have gradually built our present highly organized bodies, our rich and beautiful country with its magnificent natural resources, its propitious climate, etc., and are thus enjoying the fruits of our work in previous existences in heaven and on earth. The Hindu race was the first in the Aryan epoch. It has been degenerating ever since we left it, is now inhabited by the most backward spirits born into Aryan bodies, and as we implanted such strong spiritual tendencies in them, heredity has yet preserved the trait in the Hindu bodies so that they are more amenable to spiritual impacts 
than the more material bodies of the later races, yet it is not as high an order of spirituality as expressed when we were in the Hindu bodies. The bodies have degenerated and the spirits are less evolved than we, so that the race distinguishes itself more by a highly analytical mind than by a true spirituality. Having retained a full realization of and an implicit faith in the doctrine of rebirth, which the Westerner has lost temporarily, and being backward, the Hindus are naturally indolent and do not seek to improve their physical conditions in earth life, nor between incarnations. As a consequence, the country has also degenerated with the bodies, and the resulting suffering has for its purpose to awaken them to the necessity of concentrating on material things that they may learn to conquer the earth as we are doing. They are to follow in our footsteps and forget for a time their spiritual being in order to master the important lessons of this material world. Lack of worldly goods is to drive them to abandon the spiritual side of their development and take up the material phase. Our plentitude and material prosperity has the opposite end in view. It is destined to cause in us the nausea of satiety, to drive us to a realization of the worthlessness of material things, to cause us to turn anew to the spiritual, and in the degree that new inventions and better means of distribution make life easier, will the desire for the higher life overrule the desire for worldly success. Our concentration upon material things and our consequent worldly success has gradually given us such an impetus in the material direction that we are forgetting our spiritual nature as a superstitious fallacy exploded by scientific facts. Our scientific, ultra-materialistic attitude is the very opposite to the attitude of the Hindus, and, as extremes meet, the ultra-materialism of Western thought works destructively on Western lands, as Oriental indolence has laid waste the East Indies. There is a connection between materialism and seismic and other disturbances. In the Rosicrucian cosmoconception, a chapter has been devoted to the description of the different layers of the earth, so far as that is allowed and possible without initiation. Suffice it here to say that there are nine such layers of different thicknesses, and that the core forms a tenth part. This is the seat of the consciousness of the earth spirit. It is a fact that is patent to the occult investigator that this earth spirit feels all we do. When in the autumn the harvester mows down the ripened grain, there is a feeling of pleasure, of joy in having brought forth, a feeling akin to that felt by the cow when milk is taken from its bursting udders by its offspring. When flowers are plucked, it is the same. But when trees or plants are pulled out by the roots, the earth spirit experiences pain, for the plant kingdom is to it what the hair is to our body. The earth spirit is not affected by our acts alone, however. It feels our mental attitude as well. There is one particular layer in the earth that reflects our passions, feelings, and emotions in a most startling manner and causes them to react upon us as storm, flood, and earthquake. Materialism causes volcanic eruptions, and the more spiritual conditions prevail, the more such cataclysmic events will cease to startle the world. That is a statement hard to verify by the ordinary man, and would not have been made were it not possible to give at least circumstantial evidence of its verity. This evidence is derived from a study of the trend of thought at the times when the eruptions of Vesuvius have occurred. The list of the cataclysms which have taken place in our era begin with the eruption which destroyed Herculaneum and Pompeii, where Pliny the Elder perished, A.D. 79, then 203, 472, 512, 652, 982, 1036, 1158, 1500, 1631, 1737, 1794, 1822, 1855, 1872, 1885, 1891, 1906. There have been 18 eruptions in 1900 years. The first half, nine, occurred in 1600 years, during the time of the so-called Dark Ages, when man was ignorant and superstitious enough to believe in God and even in elves, fairies, and such foolishness. Since the advent of modern science has brought enlightenment into the Western world, demonstrated the superfluity of God, and taught us that we are the highest intelligence in the cosmos, that the brain is a gland which secretes thoughts as the liver secretes bile, that we talk with the same force that we use to think, and much more of the same nature. These cataclysmic reactions have been correspondingly numerous. There have been nine eruptions during the 300 years since modern science 
has labored for our enlightenment as against the other nine catastrophes which occurred in the Dark Ages in 1600 years. The first six occurred in the first thousand years of our era, the last five within a period of 51 years. If we number the strides taken by science in the last century, and particularly in the last 60 years, the inference is obvious that as materialism increases, the volcanic eruptions become more numerous. The more it spreads, the more points on the earth will become affected. The above is not to be understood to mean that science is detrimental in the eyes of the occultists. It has its legitimate places as an educator of the human race, but where it divorces itself from religion and becomes materialistic, as has been the case in modern times, it becomes a menace to humanity. There was a time when religion, art, and science were reunited and taught in the mystery temples, even so late as in Greece. But as this is the plane of separateness and specialization, they have been purposely separated for a time, in order that they might attain a greater perfection than would have been possible if they had remained united. In due time they will all three be united again, and then, and only then, will we get perfect satisfaction through the heart, the intellect, and the senses. The heart will enjoy the religious ceremonial aspect, the intellect will be satisfied by the scientific side, and the aesthetic side of man's nature will be catered to by the various arts as they will be employed in the temple service of the future. When man has spiritualized his being under the influence of scientific and artistic religion of the future day, he will have learned self-control and have become unselfishly helpful to his fellow being. He will then be a safe guardian of the thought power, whereby he will be able to form accurate ideas which will be immediately fit to crystallize into useful things. This will be accomplished by means of the larynx, which will speak the creative word. All things in nature were spoken into existence by the word, which was made flesh. John 1. Sound or spoken thought will be our next force in manifestation, a force that will make us creative godmen when, through our present schooling, we have fitted ourselves to use such an enormous power for the good of all, regardless of self-interest.